Let's just pray. Father, we thank you, especially on this day, for your love. I just pray, Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. I pray for us to hear what you have to say. Walk up and down through the aisles with your Holy Spirit. Touch our hearts. We'll give you all the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to share a story with you. Um, in 1989, an 8.2 earthquake almost flattened Armenia, killing over 30,000 people in less than four minutes. It's hard to imagine the anguish and the pain and the suffering that began in those four brief minutes of time. People's worlds were shaken and lives were crushed. In spite of the devastation, such tragedies often bring out the best in people. At least it provides a window to peek at the contents of each heart. Let me show you the heart, the loving heart of one father. In the midst of chaos and destruction, he rushed to his son's school. But instead of a school, he found a shapeless heap of rubble. Imagine what went through his mind. What would have gone through your mind? Perhaps shock would have crippled you as it did the other parents who were walking around dazed. They were clutching their hearts and they were calling out their child's name. But in the case of this father, the sight of rubble and ruin only made him spring into action. He ran to the back corner of the building where his son's classroom used to be and began to dig. Why? What real hope did he have? What were the chances that his son could have survived such destruction? All he knew was that he had made a promise to always be there for his son. It was this promise that gave strength to his body and motivated him mentally. As he began to dig, well-meaning parents tried to pull him out of the rubble and said, it's too late, they're dead, you can't help, go home. There's nothing you can do. The fire chief tried to pull him off the rubble by saying, fire and explosions are happening everywhere. You're in danger, go home. Finally, the police came and they said, you're angry, you're distraught, but it's over, go home. But this father had made a promise to always be there for his son. As fathers and mothers, don't we feel that way? Don't we promise to always be there for our children? Don't we always want to be watching over them? Well, my message today on Father's Day is entitled, A Watchful Father. What does being watchful mean? Well, watchful means to be alert, observant, attentive, vigilant, on the alert, wide awake, and on the lookout. What does it mean to observe? Well, it means to look at and keep your attention on something or somebody over a period of time. To watch someone, spend time observing them closely. Keep lookout, to keep a lookout for something that might appear or happen. To monitor something or somebody. To keep something or somebody under observation as a protective measure to gather information or exert control. And to keep vigil is to stay awake and keep vigil, watch and guard or pray. Doesn't it all sound like what God, our Heavenly Father, does? He is a wonderful Father. There's a really neat website on, on the internet called gotquestions.org. And they had a little interesting thing about the Christian Father they said, the Christian father is really an instrument in God's hand. The whole process of instruction and discipline must be that which God commands and which he administers, so that his authority should be brought into constant and immediate contact with the mind and the heart and the conscience of children. They go on to say, discipline must be exercised with watchful care and constant training with much prayer. Christian discipline is needed to enable children to grow up with reverence for God, respect for parental authority, and knowledge of Christian standards and habits of self-control. When you think about a father, and especially our Heavenly Father, how important do you think fathers are? You know, in my research, I read some amazing Bible facts. 
Jesus traveled and taught for three years. We all knew that. There are about 110 pages in the Bible dedicated to his ministry and to his message. We have approximately 25,000 words that Jesus spoke recorded in the Bible. And of those 25,000 words Jesus taught, he taught about the Father in heaven at least 181 times. This means that one out of every 140 words that Jesus was speaking was about his Father. His central message and purpose was to restore us to a relationship with our Daddy in heaven. Think of Bible verses about the Father in heaven. All but two of the ones, I chose a few verses here, but all but two of them are spoken directly by Jesus. In Matthew, Jesus said, Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And later in Matthew chapter 18, he says, What do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hills and go look for that one that wandered off? And if he finds it, I tell you the truth, he is happier about that one sheep than the ninety-nine that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should be lost. And in Luke, we read, But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. And in Luke, Jesus says, Do not be afraid, little flock. For your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. In John, he says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. In John, it says, The father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. And in Romans, it says, You did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we call Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. And then he says, Which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And the last scripture I picked out was in 1 John. It says, how great is the love of the Father. How great is that love has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. What's the point of all these verses? What's the message of these verses about our Heavenly Father that's hammering in your heart. You have a daddy who loves you. He's strong enough to protect you. He's engaged enough to teach you. He is tender enough to hug you. He's a, and he's alive enough to play with you. And the number one verse regarding the love of the Father is this amazing truth that we read in the prodigal son. No matter how far you have wandered, you can still come home. Remember he said in verse 17, what, we, what Sharon just read, when, we, when he came to his senses, he said, I will set out and go back to my father. Well, this scripture today has been about the prodigal son, but I want us to leave here today with reminders in our hearts and minds of the watchful father. What exactly is the meaning of the prodigal son? Why did Jesus tell that parable? Well, the main character in this parable, you may think it's the prodigal son, but it's not. The main character is the forgiving father. The character that remains constant throughout the story is a picture of God. And in telling the story, Jesus identifies himself with God in his loving attitude towards the lost. The younger son symbolizes the lost, the tax collectors and the sinners of that day. And the older brother represents the self-righteous people, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And the major theme of this parable seems to be 
not so much the conversion of the prodigal son or of the sinner, but rather the restoration of a believer into fellowship with the father. In this story, the father waits and watches eagerly for his son's return rather than going out to search for him. We see in this story the graciousness of the father overshadowing the sinfulness of the son. It's the memory of the father's goodness that brings that prodigal son to repentance. The son could return home and he could lovingly serve his father. Remember he said like even the, pig, the pigs are eating better, even the, the, the pigs are eating better than I can and I can go back and eat with the servants. Do you know there's hope for every sinner because Jesus welcomes everyone. What's in your life that your kids will remember about you? What qualities will bring them into fellowship with you and more importantly with the Heavenly Father? Jesus portrays the Father as waiting for the Son, perhaps daily searching in the distant road, hoping for his appearance. The Father didn't go out and search for the boy, but he let him learn his lessons the hard way and discover how good it was back home. This is often hard to do. We as parents know that, and grandparents. I guess that's what's referred to as tough love. And I wonder sometimes if we as dads and moms get in the way of God working out his plan for our children. I think one of my most frequent prayers is, Lord, save my family, but help me not to get in the way. Because we may want everything for our children, but God wants what's best. And sometimes what's best doesn't seem like it's the right way, but it always turns out to be God's way and the best way. Because you look back at the things in your life and you say, if that hadn't have happened, I wouldn't be where I am today. The father notices the son while he's a long way off. And his compassion looks at his son's pitiful his state. He might have got reports from somebody, oh, your son's off doing this or that. But during that time, it wasn't the custom. When you look at, if you look at all the commentaries, it wasn't the custom of men to run. Yet the father runs to greet his son. Why should he break convention for this wayward child who'd sinned against him? Well, the obvious answer is because he loved him so much. He couldn't help it. He just ran to him. And he was eager to show his son that love and to restore his relationship. And when the father reaches his son, he doesn't only throw his arms around him, but he gives him a kiss of love. He's so filled at joy with his son's return that he doesn't even let his son finish his confession. Nor does he question or lecture him. Instead, he unconditionally forgives him, and he accepts him back into fellowship. He, the son came home in rags, and his father not only clothed him, but he adorned him. The father running to his son, greeting him with a kiss, and ordering the celebration is a picture of how our Heavenly Father feels towards sinners who repent. God greatly loves us, and he patiently waits for us to repent so that he can show us his great mercy because he doesn't want anybody to perish. If the par in the parable of the prodigal, Jesus provided a pattern for healthy relationship between adult children and their parents. The father acknowledged the independence of both sons, even against his better judgment in the case of the young son. The father allowed both sons to make their own decisions and bear their consequences of their actions. I used to have a sign on my fridge and, and those of you who know me well know that I've been a Weight Watcher all my life. I go up and down. I just keep a whole assortment of clothes in my closet just in case. And I just go, with, I'd go shopping in my closet whatever day I've been good and whatever size I'm in. And the sign said, God may forgive us of our sins, but we live with the consequences. And I have that, I, I have that on my fridge. Or I had it on my other fridge where it's stuck. Stainless steel doesn't hold stickies very well. But you know, God lets us have free choice. We have free choice. He doesn't say, you love me, you love me. He said, come unto me, come unto me. But he gives you the choice. He doesn't rope you in. And... So we can choose whether to follow him or not. And that's what this father did in this story. And the father extended to each son unconditional, forgiving love. And you know, when we receive the free gift of salvation by Jesus Christ, that's what our Father is doing for us. What made the prodigal son return and repent? It was his affliction. 
He was in want. He needed something. And then he came to his senses. Do you know that afflictions, whether they're approved by divine grace or not, they can prove a means of turning sinners from the errors in their ways. Your ears are open to discipline and your heart is willing to receive when you reach the end of yourself and the end of your whatever you have. When we say that nothing but Christ brings comfort and healing and satisfaction, I know before I, when I, was, before I was a Christian, I had tried everything. There was drugs, you name it, even back in those days, even back in the old days. I tried everything. And when I asked Jesus Christ into my heart, it was like I had been crawling across the desert and I finally got a drink of water. I thought, oh, that's what I've been looking for. And I went through hard times to bring me to that point. And that's for another day. The commentaries say to apply it spiritually. So as I said, when we see we can't find anything, anything to give us pleasure or to give us that peace, we turn to Christ. You know that song, he was there all the time waiting patiently in line? How sad that we have to try everything first before we finally see that the best is there, that we just don't turn to him. But that's our free choice, and that's what we choose. So the father, when the son came to him, was he welcome? Yes, most heartily. And by the way, that's an example to us parents whose children have been foolish and disobedient. If our children repent and submit themselves to the authority, then we shouldn't be harsh and severe with them, but we should give them wisdom from above, which is gentle and easy to be requested, to be followers of God, to show mercy. It's strange that here not one word of rebuke came to the son. He didn't say, well, why didn't you just stay with your harlots and your swine? You could never find the way home unless you were beaten by a rod and by your own rod. No, there was none of that talk. When God forgives a person who truly repents, there's no condemnation. He forgets our sins. He remembers them no more. They shall not be mentioned against them. Psalm 103 says, For as, you know, everybody knows this one, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. But that's not, that is not all. We have a rich and royal provision. And this was made for the son because he was a birth son. Because of his birth and his quality, far beyond what he did or could expect. And you know, when we ask Jesus Christ into our hearts, we are grafted into the family of God. We are shed his blood on us. He shed his blood. We are covered with righteousness. And we come as an adopted son. And we are co-heirs with Christ. We are God's sons. Anybody who returns to him and cast yourselves on his mercy. Scripture's filled with people that we can learn much from. When it comes to challenging vocation of fatherhood, we can think of several fathers in the Bible. Some show us what's wise to do, and some show us what's not wise to do. And one of the examples is King David, who was a man after God's own heart. Noah was a righteous man. Joseph was an earthly father of Jesus. Adam, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses. And finally, we have a profile of God, the ultimate role model for all human dads and moms. God the Father, the first person in the Trinity, is the Father and Creator of all. Jesus, his only Son, showed us new, intimate ways of relating to the Father. When we see God as our Heavenly Father, our Provider, and our Protector, it puts our life in a whole new perspective. Every human can be a son of the Most High, the constant source of our strength, our wisdom, and our hope. His love, his kindness, his patience, his wisdom, his protectiveness are impossible standards to live up to. But fortunately, he is forgiving and understanding, and he answers our prayers and gives us expert guidance so we can be the man or woman that the, in the family wants us to be. You only need to ask him for his help and guidance. 
I know some of you, and many of you, and I really appreciated when you first opened the service, Charmaine, and you talked about what is normal, and we don't have normal. We have a new kind of normal, right? And that we've all had something in our lives that would color our perception of what a father is or what a mother is. And I know that not all of us have been blessed with good and godly fathers. Some of you have been rejected by your fathers. Some of you have had a father who may have left you in your family. Some may have had fathers that have died. Some may have had fathers who treated you badly or abused you. Well, let me tell you, the verses in the Bible are God's promises to his people. God, who is our father and who can never go back on his word. And he can never contradict his word. He said he would never leave you or forsake you. He said he loves you with an everlasting love. He said all who come to him through Jesus, he will in no wise cast out. He said no one could take us from his hand. He said he will always be with us. He said he would supply our every need. He said his grace is sufficient for us. He said he would be with us through the tough times. And I think of the tough times that people in this congregation have had, and even our family, being cancer survivors in our family. But he said he would be with us through those times. He didn't promise we wouldn't go through them, but he said he would be with us. He said we would have victory over death by trusting Jesus as our Savior. So when we leave this earth, yes, there is a physical death, but we don't have to die a spiritual death because he said we would have victory over that, and that's through Jesus Christ. He said we would not be overtaken by temptation. He said all things work together for those who love him. He said we will have everlasting life if we receive his son Jesus. And he said... He would wipe away all our tears. Remember the story I started with about the dad searching for his son in the ruined rubble of his son's school after the earthquake in Armenia? Remember as the father began digging, everyone tried to pull him out of the rubble saying, it's too late, they're dead, and he was told to go home. Even the police told him of the extreme danger to go home. But this father had made a promise, and he was going to keep it. The love this father had in his heart for his son kept him digging for 8 hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, 36 hours. Then in the 38th hour, he pulled back a boulder and he heard his son's voice crying for help. Immediately he screamed, Armand! And back came the words, Dad, I told them, I told the other kids that if you were still alive, you'd save me. You promised. You said you'd always be there for me. You did it, Dad. A determined father, a promise kept, and a stone rolled away to reveal life and give freedom. The story of Armin's dad reminds us of the events of that first Easter when our Heavenly Father kept a greater promise by rolling away a much more significant stone. With the rolling away of that stone came eternal life and true lasting freedom in Christ. And you know what? Our Heavenly Father is still in the business of rolling away stones. What are the stones in your life? It doesn't matter how big or how small they may be. Our Father is looking for you right now. He's looking through the rubble and the ruin of our lives, not live for Him. And He wants to roll away your stone of despair, your rock of remorse, your boulder of bondage. May you remember or perhaps even discover for the first time that our God has made the greatest promises ever made. And we mentioned a few of them. And he is abundantly able to keep them all just as he kept that very special promise to his own son some 2,000 years ago. Like the prodigal son's father, God is waiting for us to welcome you. He's waiting for, to welcome us with open arms. Happy Father's Day to all you dads, and to all you dads, or those soon-to-be dads, and for those who are just like dads to someone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for being such a good and loving dad. 
I pray for those of us who have and those of us who are lost or wandered away to see your loving arms welcoming us home. Let us run to meet you, and we say thanks for running to meet us as we come. I pray a special blessing on all the men and boys in this church and on all this congregation. Thank you for them, and I pray that you will continue to lead them in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen.